Hi. <clears throat> I have an ancient mercury thermometer here, and uh, we're going to study heat, so I thought I'd get started with this. The idea <clears throat> is that this in this thermometer, mercury expands as it becomes hotter, and it goes this direction. It just expands. So we'll put this away and get started by defining temperature. You have to do this very carefully, and you'll see how sneaky I am with this temperature. We will come back when we know a lot more physics and get a better definition for temperature. But right now, all we can say about temperature is uh, da, 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 that quantity that is equal for two, mm, what should we say? Bodies? No, I'll be informal. I'll say two things that have been in contact forever. Yep. <clears throat> so there you go. You don't really have a very practical definition there, but that's all that I can say about temperature. And some people call this the, uh, well, there are three laws of thermodynamics, one, two, and three, and this is, of course, how they all start. So it's the zeroth law of thermodynamics. Thermodynamics means, I guess, the study of the flow of heat. And one way of saying that temperature is the quantity that's equal for two things that have been in contact forever is <clears throat> that I could also say that if one substance has a high temperature and another substance has a low temperature, then heat will flow from the hot thing to the cold thing. So I'm going to just draw a little picture of this. Um, this is a hot thing because it has T large and this is a cold thing because it has T small and heat's gonna be heat's gonna be like this it's gonna be like heat's gonna go that way so that's our definition of temperature right now and there are these two scales that we should discuss the um, the Celsius scale and the Fahrenheit scale. I'm a big fan, obviously, of all things SI, but I understand it's gonna take some sacrifice for you Americans to get used to using Fahrenheit, uh, I mean, dumping Fahrenheit and using Celsius. But uh, let's see, the cool things we know about Fahrenheit and Celsius, I'm gonna see if I can spell Fahrenheit right, good luck. F-A-H-R-E-N-H E I T? Yeah. Fahrenheit has, uh, well, it's got a freezing point of water and it's got a boiling point of water. And Celsius has a freezing point of water and a boiling point of water. So let's see if we can fill in this little chart right here and we will find the relationship between them in just a moment. Fahrenheit boils at um, 212 degrees. Dang, and freezes at 32 degrees. Handy, right? Super handy. <laughs> so my understanding is that this, um, the zero for the Fahrenheit scale was set as the coldest temperature that this guy, Fahrenheit, could make in his lab. Good job, Fahrenheit. How about that? setting an absolute temperature scale around that? Great, and we still use this thing. And then 100 was designed to be the temperature of a normal human. Now it's 98.6 because he wasn't very good at measuring temperature. That, let's excuse him for that. He was one of the first people to do that properly. But, uh, but using the scale is a little bit ridiculous at this point because these numbers are stupid and you don't want to have to remember them. Some easy numbers to remember are 0 and 100. Yeah, those are easy numbers to remember. And then there's this other temperature scale that we don't want to talk about quite yet. Let's make a connection between these two temperature scales. There's a linear relationship because I'm taking this number of degrees, what's that, 180, and I'm stretching it down to just being 100 degrees, and I'm probably going to offset it because the freezing points aren't the same. So let's make an equation that says the temperature in Fahrenheit is some number times the temperature in Celsius plus some other number, that offset. And if you use this equation and these four facts, you'll be able to derive a relationship for the Fahrenheit temperature in terms of the Celsius temperature. And you're going to need that, so I suggest you do it right now. Let's presume that you've already done it and we can continue. 
Now that you've got that cute relationship, the, um, <clears throat> the wonderful thing that you need to know about temperature is that you can make, well, here's this thing. You can make a device. It's a thermometer, and it's called a constant volume gas thermometer. So I'll show you what it looks like. There's a, <clears throat> a gas bowl of some sort, maybe a sphere of, of glass, and inside it you're gonna put a gas and then you have this tube that comes out and goes way up It's like a pumpkin with a really long stem and it goes arbitrarily up and it's open to the atmosphere and everything is cool So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put some mercury in here. <clears throat> I don't know if I have a silver pen So I'm gonna have to use brown mm, No, I'm gonna try to find gray. Wait, don't leave me now. Don't leave me, oh, I got gray. Check it out. So mercury comes in here and you fill it up and you trap the gas in there. So here's the mercury and it's like do 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 do. And you know that there must be some pressure in this gas. We're probably gonna pressurize the gas. So the way to get a pressure, if I, if I had it like this, then the pressure in there would be equal to atmospheric pressure. Let's see if we can argue that. The pressure here is the same. So the pressure at all heights of the mercury is the same, 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 same. So then you'd say that the pressure here is atmospheric pressure. Remember, this is open to the atmosphere. I should note that. Open to atmosphere. And then the pressure here would be equal to the pressure there. But I'm going to put more mercury in. In fact, I'm going to put in mercury until we get up to some point, which we'll be able to call H. This is my reference point right here. So everything above that is going to be causing pressure on the gas that's above the atmospheric pressure. And I put a little tick mark. I actually put a tick mark on the glass here. And I say that's my reference point. That's how I ensure that we have a constant volume. Because I add or subtract mercury. Careful with it. It's very toxic. But I keep adding or subtracting mercury to make sure that I keep this volume of gas the same in here. So here's my gas. Let's make it a blue gas inside my glass pumpkin. So <clears throat> there's a gas in here, and this is a constant, what, constant volume? Constant volume thermometer. And the constant volume thermometer is fantastically useful. And they derived, they devised these things in the early 1700s. There was a guy named, oh, I forgot his name. Well, shucks, maybe I'll tell you his name later. But the guy in the 1702 or something first theorized that something very interesting was happening with gases. He put a lump of air in here and he was measuring this height. Let's, um, let's write down an equation for the pressure of the gas. The pressure of the gas is going to be atmospheric pressure. Let's write it more carefully. Atmospheric pressure plus, um, I guess it's going to be rho times G times H. And this is rho of mercury. Rho of mercury times baby G times the H of mercury that we find right there. That's the height of mercury. Okay, <clears throat> so the really cool thing was he then made a graph. And you know that I like graphs. So the graph looked like this. He was graphing pressure as a function of temperature. And as the temperature, he was using Celsius, and uh, he, as the temperature got lower, the pressure also got lower, which means he would need less and less mercury to provide the pressure to keep the gas from moving. Because remember, he was always trying to keep this reference line at the same location. So he's starting here at room temperature, and he's getting colder, and he's getting colder, and he went even below, yeah, this was past Fahrenheit, so he went even below zero in the Celsius, and he got a little colder, and then the air turned to a liquid, so it went, pressure dropped to zero. Cool. But then he could connect these dots. Uh, well, yeah, he could connect these dots. Nah, let's say he didn't connect the dots yet. I want to get these dots a little bit bigger. And, um, and then he took another gas. 
I don't know what he was studying. Maybe he got uh, get some argon or something. That'd be cool. And he uh, he found a, I'm actually just throwing these numbers out here. I have no idea. He tested at the same temperatures though, and it was interesting that he also found these guys to um, to follow this strange pattern. But maybe it uh, it liquefied at a slightly lower temperature, and so he had these data right here. But as he was going, notice it, it would liquefy. And that's a little bit frustrating, but it, you know, it is what it is. And then he might take this other gas, which natively had a, an even lower pressure. Maybe he got some hydrogen or something, um, something very simple like that. And he found it to do this kind of thing. And, uh, and, and maybe, it, uh, maybe it took a really long time to liquefy. I don't even know if there's this relationship, but I'm making stuff up right now. But suddenly the pressure would drop down to zero. And so there's not anything obvious going on here except, oh wait, except this line and that line and that line have different slopes and they have different y-intercepts. But there's something interesting about it. If you'll notice, this line and that line, and that line, maybe I fudged a little bit on my sketch. These lines all intersected at a point on the temperature scale, and he said that temperature is something special. He's saying even for the toughest, most phytonous gas that might not liquefy, I propose there might even be such a gas that if, that if I brought it all the way over here and got the temperature as low as possible, it would stop having pressure. And pressure is referring to movement, right? Pressure comes from motion, and so at this location right here, everything stops. And I guess you could say that the temperature is as low as it gets. Some people might call it absolutely low. And so we can find, oh, guess what? This, oh man, I don't have any way to write it right now. Between here and here is 273.15 degrees and or I should write I should write Celsius degrees it's that many Celsius degrees you know the difference between Celsius degrees Celsius degrees and degrees Celsius this refers to a temperature and this refers to a temperature change so that difference there 273.15 Celsius degrees means that that's the span in between the temperature of zero Celsius and the temperature of absolute zero and we define the system of Kelvin. We say that temperature in Kelvin is temperature in Celsius plus 273.15. So this is Kelvin temperature. And notice I'm not going to put a subscript on it because that's real temperature. That's the temperature that physicists are interested in. So we've got Kelvin here. And Kelvin puts us in a good mood because it's real. We've talked about this a little bit with our sound lab. You noticed that taking, um, taking stuff outside and doing speed of sound experiments didn't have a big effect. And that's because the temperature is really not changing very much on the Kelvin scale. Bye-bye.